Well, good morning, y'all. Uh, this morning, I want to continue in our series uh, that we've entitled The Secret to Life. And we've been looking at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, as found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And there he uses a word that, from the original Greek, it's the word makarios, which means that to not only have a blessed life, but to have a supremely blessed life. And he begins to lay out for us what that looks like. And so we saw that Jesus says we are to be salt and light and to live generously and to have an agape life. And so today we want to continue in that in chapter 6 where Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, for moth and rust will destroy or thieves may break in and steal. Instead, invest in treasures that are in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy or corrode, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So, um, we have always said that here at... Westridge, we want to be honest about the stuff in our lives and um, to be transparent about things. And so um, I have a bit of a confession that I want to make this morning. Um, And I have, uh, I don't think I've ever talked about this publicly, and you'll know why in a second. Uh, But I just want to let you all know that I have become a Houston Astros fan. (laughs) Now, this doesn't diminish my commitment to the Cubs because technically the Astros are in the American League, Cubs are in the National League, right? And should the odds of, you know, ever having a World Series wherever I'd be having to force to pick sides, I think would be when Jesus would be coming back and I wouldn't have to worry about that anyway. Um, But in my defense, I just want to say that I spent the last four years of my life building a, uh, developing a residential luxury high-rise that actually looks right down into Minute Maid Park. I think we have a picture of the view. So when you look at that, I look at that every day. Um, And the owner of the Astros took a unit in the building. And so how can I not wear like Astros stuff when I'm like around? But I'm not defensive about it or anything. Uh, but anyway, you know, as, uh, as I've kind of been down there, I've developed this emotional attachment to this team, and so I've uh, went, decided to go to the playoffs this last week and root for the Astros against Boston, and I know Sean's in the house, but, you know, no comments there. Uh, and I have to say that I love this Astros team because they're this bunch of guys who have come from very humble beginnings, and they haven't forgotten where they come from, and they're just great guys. And, you know, I don't know if you guys saw the World Series last year, but they played with such heart. I mean, it was guys like Altuve and Correa who were just amazing, and the fun just oozed out of them. I mean, look at that. I mean, it was just really contagious. They kept it loose. They were aggressive in their batting and their and their base running, and as a result, I think they pulled off probably one of the biggest upsets in all of baseball history. This young team pulled off becoming World Series champions. It was, it, they were playing to win at every at-bat, and it was obvious they were having a great time doing it. You know why? They had nothing to lose. It was absolutely a blast to watch these guys have so much fun. However, This year, as you may have read, was a completely different story, because I'm sure none of you saw the games. Um, But they were, this year they were the defending world champions, right? And they had everything to lose. And it became pretty obvious pretty quickly that this year was a completely different ball game. And it just seemed like they were holding on so tight that they just couldn't let go, and they were just playing not to lose rather than to win. 
There was no passion, no fun, and it was almost painful watching these guys get swept by the Red Sox at home, no less. The former coach of DePaul, Coach Meyer, once said about one of the greatest losses that he'd ever experienced in his career was our greatest error in the game was that instead of playing to win, we just played not to lose. I think that is one of the most insightful statements about life that I've ever heard. Because as it relates to our lives, instead of playing to win, typically, most of us, the majority of us, are living life and we're just playing not to lose. But what we discover is that when we play not to lose, typically, most of the time, we lose everything. One of my favorite pieces of research uh, that was ever done was by a sociologist, and he interviewed more than 50 people over the age of 95, and he asked him one simple question. He said, if you had to do it all over again, if you had to live your life again, what would you do differently? And they all said basically the same three things. First of all, they would have reflected on their life more. They would have moments of self-evaluation so that they could change direction or really determine the, the direction of their lives. Secondly, they would have risked more. They felt like they played it too safe and lived their life down the middle of the fairway, not taking enough risks. And the third was that they felt like they would have done more to make a difference been part of something bigger with a sense of purpose or mission. I think we're all looking for having some meaning in our lives, and we all want to be part of something bigger, something that we can invest in that will last beyond our lifetime, to have some legacy. But I think that most of us don't. And I don't know whether it's because we just don't know how we can't figure it out, or we don't want to do the work that it takes to figure it out, or we don't want to make the sacrifices that are essential in order to make the kind of radical commitment to do something that has a sense of purpose but doesn't pay the bills. And that's just it, right? We get into this protectionist bunker mentality where we make a decision, whether it's conscious or unconscious, and we say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to take care of me and mine. And that's what our life becomes about. And instead of playing to win, our life becomes all about just playing not to lose. And we hold on so tightly to all the wrong stuff. So that we can what? Not run out of money if we actually live to the ripe old age of 95? A great example of this is when Jesus describes this story in Luke chapter 12, and he says, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, This is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones and there I will store my surplus grain and I will say to myself, dude, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry, enjoy life. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. And then who's going to get what you've prepared for yourself? And this is how it'll be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. It's really the crux of it, isn't it, that Jesus has been driving in this Sermon on the Mount? Storing up the wrong stuff for ourselves, living for the wrong things in our life, and not living a life that is makarios, that is rich towards God. That is a guy who was playing not to lose. 
He could have taken the money that he made and used it to do some incredible things, to make a difference in this world, to leverage that and, and, and do amazing things. But instead, he had this protectionist bunker mentality that was all about protecting his interests and making sure that his future was secure. And the problem was, when he finally made it, he dies. And Jesus points out the irony. He says, now... You worked all your life to like build up all this wealth and now somebody else is going to get to enjoy it, not even you. And when he dies, all of that that he worked so hard for was worth nothing to him in the end. And look, we can sit here and armchair quarterback that story all day long till we're blue in the face, but the truth is we do the same thing, don't we? In our own realm, instead of playing to win, Leveraging what we have to live large in Jesus, no matter how much we have or don't have or time that we have or think that we don't have. Instead, we shrink back in fear of losing what we have and we hold on tight to all the wrong stuff. According to Jesus, we have a choice. We can either invest our lives in the stuff of this world where we know as sure as we need air to breathe that one day it will all come to an end. Or we can invest our lives in the stuff of God where the Bible tells us that it will last forever. Jesus says it's your choice. You pick. But if you pick a life without me, Go in, eyes wide open, because we all know how that story ends. I think the essence of it is what we put our faith in, right? I mean, for decades, we put our faith in the American dream to own our own home. Our parents did it, our grandparents did it, and for those who But for those of us who bought a home before the downturn, we all thought we were making a sound investment, right? We watched as home prices went up year after year after year. We thought, this is great. I can't lose. So we we decide we're going to buy a home. We plop down our down payment. We make that investment. It's supposed to be our nest egg where we just sit back and watch our value keep going up and up and up until the day that we're retiring, right? What we couldn't even conceive of was the complete erosion of what all of us put our faith in, which was the U.S. economy. We thought it was way too strong to be able to fail. And yet, now, more than 10 years since that time, Many of us are still underwater in our homes with, compared to where we originally purchased. The recession, I think, is a great metaphor and a huge wake-up call for a lot of us because we realize that there are no guarantees for anything that we invest in, in this world. And so the question is, what on earth are we able to invest in where the value does not erode. I would love it if we could take a different perspective about our lives. Because so many of us have this starting point where we want to make financial goals for our retirement and to make sure that we don't run out of money if we live beyond a certain expectation. I would love to be able just to turn that around and to begin with life on our deathbed. Sounds a little morbid. But to understand that we have a presupposition that on our deathbed, money will have no meaning for us. It'll have no value. So as we're lying there and we're contemplating our lives, what does? What does have meaning? I think from what I've seen and from what I've read and when I've talked to people personally who are in that position, when they look back, they want to know that they had a Makarios life. That they were super blessed. A fulfilling life. 
full of mission and purpose, and that they want to die with no regrets. So is it possible that we can start there and work our way back and say, how do I end up in that spot? How do I end up in that moment where I can actually leave this world with no regrets? How do I plan for that? What does my retirement planning look like now to make sure that that happens? Jesus puts it like this. Do not, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust will destroy any treasure that you keep here or thieves may break in and steal. Instead, invest in treasures that are in heaven where moth and rust cannot corrode and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I think that Jesus is making an important point here. And he says, when you peel away all of the superficial layers of our, of our life and you get down to the core of who you really are, what are you left with? What's driving you? What makes your life tick? What are you holding on to so tightly that you're just too afraid of letting it go? What are you invested in? When we invest our lives and our faith in something, Jesus wants to make sure that we're investing it in things that go beyond the realm of this world. God desires that we invest in things that are eternal. Or as Jesus puts it, where moth and rust will not destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. In other words, to invest in things that are not material, but things that have real meaning. Things that last. And I think that this whole thing comes down to developing a, a passion for God, where our faith becomes more than just a Sunday morning thing or a quick prayer before dinner thing. It's building a faith that is sustainable, a faith that is strong enough to carry us when all of the junk of this world tried to distract us away from what is real in this world. Jesus asks that we make him the one thing in our life that drives everything else. And when that happens, it will be a life of passion that goes way beyond anything we can ever imagine. It will be a Makarios life. And then he drives this point home by hitting us all in a very, very vulnerable spot. And he says, look, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Sermon on the Mount is pretty tough stuff. And I have to admit that this is a pretty tough passage for me personally. Because, to be honest with you, in my business, I enjoy making money. I like doing deals. I like building high-rises. In fact, I will go as far as to say is I hate doing deals that lose money. Is that so wrong? So I've got to keep myself in check all the time because I'm around it all the time. I literally am swimming with sharks all the time. And the question is, when I get down to the core of my life, is building wealth, is making money my master? I sure hope not. But I do ask myself that all the time. And what I hope is that I'm really living this life and playing to win. And while I have fun doing deals and while I have fun making money, I'm having way more fun taking the money that God has blessed me with to make a difference. To 
taking that money and taking the gifts that God has given me and leveraging those to become salt and light and agape and living a generous life in a dark world. I grew up pretty poor by American standards. And to become an owner of my own company, to be able to become a developer, to have the opportunities that I've been given is pretty humbling. And I have to tell you, to be honest with you, there's a lot of times that I feel guilt about it. And so for me, I have to take the responsibility that I've been given seriously and to look beyond the protectionist bunker of my own household and to really understand that God is asking me to do something in this world that goes beyond my own family. And that's why Shelby and I are so heavily invested here at Westridge, both financially and in our time and our commitment, as well as Nika Angels, because we want to play to win. We want to live a Macarios life where we're just having a blast living large in Jesus. And I think that when you come from nothing, as both Shelby and I have, you really don't have as much to lose because we lived on Hamburger Helper for most of our growing up years. And we can do it again if we have to. Right? And there's some comfort in that, knowing that you can go back to that. I'm not going back to spam. <laughs> but Hamburger Helper is tolerable. But what I don't want is to take what I have earned and to hold on so tight that all I'm doing now is playing not to lose it. And, and to just go through my life doing the daily grind just to protect it. Because when I come to the end, I'll tell you, when I sat there with my dad as he was leaving this world and I was trying to have a conversation with him about his money, he could have cared less. He said, I don't care anymore. That means nothing to me now. You figure it out. And that's the idea, I think, of where giving comes in. And we talked about this last week, where the offering time that we have every Sunday morning, that's what keeps our hearts in check as to where we're really at, as to what really is our master. And it's a weekly reminder that everything that we work so hard for will not last, but in the end, have no value. And I think it helps us to just let go of the things that seem so important to us now, but in the end, again, will have no meaning. And it's God's desire that we get freed up and that we are able to give freely and cheerfully without resentment. I like to refer to it as the weekly practice of the letting go of this world. Every time we drop something in that offering bag, every time we push that button for online or text giving, we're releasing another little part of this world and we're saying, hey, I'm okay. <laughs> I can let go of this. I have something more valuable that I'm building my life towards. And we say this every week unless you're at a place in your relationship with God where you want to give and you have a desire to give, then we say, don't give. Because I never want anybody to give out of a sense of obligation or guilt where it becomes a resentful thing. There's no reason for that. And I'd rather you not give at all than to give for the wrong reasons. However, I will say that the opposite is also true. And here's the reality of it, because Jesus preaches it. If you're in a relationship with God, and you're not giving, or you're not giving an amount that is meaningful to you, then I would challenge your perspective about that because giving is very much a part of the Christian life. And it is very much a building block to our faith. 
It's being able to live the life that God designed us to live. And that's the reason why the Bible talks about money so much. I'm not driving this conversation about money. Jesus is all the way through it. That the more we're able to let go of this world, the more capacity we create in our lives to be able to hold tightly to the stuff of God. The more we give away, the more we are freed up to grow spiritually and to live a Makarios life of abundance. Because we're not being held down by the stuff of this world. Believe it or not, as we grow in our relationship with God, so does our desire to give. Because giving is a matter of not economics, but it's a matter of where we're at spiritually. I might be flat broke and giving more than I ever have in my life. Because for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I have been there in that moment with many people who have left this world. And I have heard a lot of people in those moments talk about their regrets, the things they wish they'd done things they wish they hadn't done, the way they wish they would have been able to live their lives. But I'll tell you this, and I can honestly say this, out of all of those moments that I have been through, there has never been one person that has ever regretted giving their life to Jesus and following him, not one. If we want to live a life where we can be in that moment at the end and leave this world with no regrets, then it's time to take the next step. To do those three things that everybody over 95 says that they wish they would have done. To evaluate their lives. To take more risks. To do more to make a difference in this world. And to not hold anything back so that we can follow Jesus to the very end. So when you strip away all of the superficial layers of your life this morning and you begin to dig deep and you look into your heart of hearts of who you really are, what do you find? What's driving you? Who are you really? What do you value the most? What are you holding on to so tightly that you don't want to lose? If you knew that you had only 30 days left in this world, what would you change? How would you live differently? Hold loosely to the stuff of this world. But hold on tight to Jesus, to the stuff of God. And for goodness sake, Let's live a Macarius life and let's all play to win.